Hi there, welcome to this QCon session, how to keep my Java application secure in the age of log for shell My name is Simon Maple. I'm the field CTO at Sneak. And in this session, we're going to be looking at the impact that log for shell uh, had on us uh, as, a, as an ecosystem and how we can better prepare ourselves for a future log for shell um, my background, I've been in Java for 20 years plus commercially uh, as a developer, as dev advocacy, as community, and now as a field CTO at Sneak, uh, which is a developer security company creating a platform to help developers uh, add security into their developer workflows. So in this session, uh, we're going to be, first of all, looking at the log for shell incident, the vulnerability uh, that existed in, in, in the log for J library. And we're going to extract from that uh, the bigger problems that can you know, impact us in future uh, in a similar way to, to log for shell. In fact, as I am recording this, we're literally a day into uh, another potential log for shell type incident, which is potentially being called uh, spring for shell uh, or spring shell, which looks like another remote code execution incident uh, that could potentially be in, in, this, in the spring uh, ecosystem. So these are the types of incidents uh, that we are you know, looking to better prepare ourselves for uh, in future. So once we talk about you know the steps we can take to 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 really help ourselves to mitigate that we're going to look at what is actually beyond the log for shell risk what is beyond that open source risk that we as as java developers and java organizations um can can you know steps we can take to first of all understand where that risk is and what steps we can actually take uh, to 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 better prepare ourselves and mitigate uh, those risks as we go so Let's uh, let's jump in. First of all, with what the log for shell incident was, and some of the bigger problems that we really uh, can can understand and take out for for future learnings. So this uh, blog post, this is one of the blog posts that we wrote from uh, Brian Vermeer uh, on December 10th, the day uh, that the vulnerability came out. Of course, of course, it had to be a Friday, Friday afternoon, Friday morning, uh, where the where the Java ecosystem was alerted. Uh, on mass at a new critical uh, log for J vulnerability. This was a remote code execution uh, vulnerability, and at the time, at the time, the uh, the suggested upgrade was to version two fifteen. This was the version uh, that at the time uh, was thought to be it was thought to contain the entire fix uh, for this incident. Uh, CVSS score, which is the score uh, that is essentially a, a, a almost built from a scorecard of a number of security questions to determine what the risk is, how easy it is to, to, to break into, et cetera. That was given a 10, and this is out of 10, so the highest possible uh, score uh, for that. Okay, let's dig a little bit deeper into, into what is actually happening under the covers and how this vulnerability came about. And it really starts off with a couple of things. First of all, the JNDI, and secondly, uh, Java serialization. So the JNDI, the Java Naming and Directory Interface, is essentially a service that is, that is there by default in, in the JDK. And it allows our applications that are deployed into a JDK to access um, potentially locally, like, like we've done here, a number of objects that can be registered into, into that JNDI. I'm sure there are many Java devs there in the audience that are, are very, very familiar with this already. It's been a very core part of the JDK for many, many years. Um, now, examples here, you might make a request with a particular string that is the effectively the, the the key of this of an object that has been registered in the JNDI. For example, m slash my ds my data source. Uh, you might want to uh, qualify that with a Java colon comp, uh, which is similar to a namespace uh, forward slash n slash my ds. And what we would get back is the my ds Java object, uh, which we can then use uh, to to you know get data etc. from a, from a database. Now. We don't always have to look to the local JNDI to, to register or get these objects back. What we can also do is make a request out to a remote JNDI. And in this case, um, here's an example of what might happen if I was to create a remote 
evil JNDI, which I was to stand up on one of my evil servers. And my application that I've deployed into the JDK can make a request out specifying, uh, you know, the in this case, the JNDI LDAP uh, server, passing in an evil.server uh, URL with a port here of 11 and requesting a bad object. And what I would get back is, is this uh, is a serialized uh, object bad uh, that I could reconstruct and I could potentially uh, execute there. Now, obviously, my application isn't going to go out and uh, request this bad object from my evil server. But what what an attacker will try and do it to to uh, you know in the attack vector here for for this type of attack is to pass in something to the application so that the application will use that input that I give it uh, to request something of my evil JNDI server. Well, that's all very well and good, but what does this have to do with Log4J? We know, I'm sure many Java developers in the audience here, Log4J is a logging environment. It's a logging uh, library and function. Why does that use, what's that got to do with the JNDI? Well, many years ago, I think it was around 2013, a, a feature was added into Log4J to be able to uh, look up certain strings, certain properties for variables and things like that, configurations from the JNDI. Okay, very often though, uh, if a logger sees a string, which is a JNDI-like lookup string, it will automatically try and perform that lookup as part of uh, as part of that request while logging. As a result, there is a potential to exploit something like this by trying to log a user input, which is a JNDI string, which contains my uh, URL with an evil uh, uh, an evil input, which will pull my evil object and potentially uh, run that. Now, typically, uh, logging very often happens on on ex exception paths and error paths. So, what we're going to see here is an attempt for attackers to try and drive down an exception path with a uh, payload of the JNDI string. And that JNDI string will relate to my evil object, which in this case here is going to perform uh, an exec passing in maybe some sensitive data uh, back to my URL and I can extract cred credentials and other things. This is one example of, of what could happen. So one of the big, big problems with this specific uh, vulnerability in this uh, what made this so so uh you know rock the java ecosystem so much is the prevalence of log4j not just in the applications that we write but in the third party libraries that we pull in because of course everyone needs logging everyone uses uh uses some kind of logging framework the question is how do we know that you know if we're not using it that someone we are relying on isn't using it as well and that's one of the that's one of the biggest problems now um at Sneak, we noticed the number of things uh, from from the customers that that use us and, and uh, scanning with us. We noticed over a third of our customers um, are, are using Log4j. Okay, and and you know we are we scan a number of uh, different ecosystems. So the you know the vast majority of our Java uh, applications had Log4j in them, but thirty five percent of overall. Uh, customers had log4j. Interestingly, 60%, almost two thirds of those are using it as a transitive dependency. So they're not using it directly in their applications, but the, the libraries, the open source third party packages that they are using are making use of log4j. And that makes it extremely hard to work out whether you are, uh, whether you have log4j in your application or not, because if you ask any developer, are you using log4j? They'll know if they're interacting directly, uh, most likely with, with with log4j. However, you know, do they know that three levels deep there is a library that they probably don't need, know they're using that uses log4j? Possibly not. So the industry exposure, as a result, is very very broad because log4j gets pulled in in so many uh, different places. So, what was the fix? If we look back at what the original fix. Or, or suggested fixes were, it's important to note that this changed very rapidly as more information uh, came in. And that is because this was a zero day vulnerability. The exploit was effectively, you know, more widely known before the vulnerability was even disclosed. And as a result, 
everyone was chasing their tails in terms of trying to understand the severity, the risk, how things could be attacked. And as a result, there was changing um, uh, mitigation strategies and changing advice depending on literally the hour of the day that, uh, that it was going through. So here's a cheat sheet that I wrote um, back in December to really suggest a number of different ways that it could be it could be fixed. Now, the important thing to note is the fix was made available very, very soon. So the, 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 the strongest mitigation case here was to upgrade Log4j uh, at the time uh, to version 215. Now, of course, in some cases, that wasn't possible. So there are uh, there are certain times where we needed to kind of like say, okay, what are the next steps then? We'll go into that in just a second. But the vast majority of people actually had a bigger problem before saying, you know, let me just upgrade my love for Jay. The biggest problem people had here was visibility, gaining visibility of all the libraries that they are using in production, all the libraries that their application is pulling in. And there are a couple of ways of doing that. Of course, there are tools that can that can that can do a lot of that uh, on your behalf. Uh, one of the air, one of the things that you know you could do if you're using something like Maven or Gradle, there were certain certain ways of of pulling that kind of data, uh, you know, from your builds. However, it's hard to be able to do that from a from a build process up because essentially, you know, you need to make sure that this is being used everywhere. It's 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 sometimes easier to look at it from the top down and actually be able to scan large repositories of your application so that you can get uh, a good understanding from the top down of what is is in your environments, what is in your uh, your Git repositories, for example. So obviously, the upgrade there, the upgrade path here is is heavily. Uh, to, to upgrade, and I believe you know we're we're, we're over in two seventeen these days in terms of what the uh, what the suggested fixes are. However, um, for those who you know perhaps you're using binaries rather than actually pulling in in your source, perhaps uh, for I think I think for example I think GitHub Enterprise for example was using uh, w w was using uh, log for J. So so what do you do in that case where you can't actually have uh, access to the source to actually perform an upgrade? Well, in some cases there were certain uh, certain uh, classes that you could just remove from the, the JDK before restarting it. And when you remove that file, uh, the, the, those classes, the vulnerable methods, the vulnerable functions had effectively been removed. So it's impossible to, to, get, to go down those paths. However, there are, are, of course, operational problems with that, because if you were to go through those paths, you might get unexpected um, behavior. Luckily, in this case, because people were either doing JNDI lookups on purpose or not, uh, it was a little bit more predictable. It wasn't something that was, you know, very, very core functionality. There were some other things that you know that that could be done, and some of these were, um, were were later on discovered that they weren't as effective as others. Um, upgrading JDK is a good example, whereby a lot of people said yes, that's what you need to do straight away. But however, after a little bit of time, it was discovered that that wasn't as effective because attackers were 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 mutating the way that they were approaching the attack and and circumventing. Uh, you know some of the ways in which we're trying to fix, and that uh, that really goes to, to the to the uh, and and you know points to the way which if we were to look at it from the runtime point of view and and, and look at things like egress uh, traffic, look at things like WAFs, these are very very short lived fixes that we can put out because the ability for an attacker to change the way uh, that they attack your environments changes literally by the minute by the day because. Um, you know, as you block something in your in your WAF, your web web application firewall, which essentially is trying to block uh, traffic inbound, which has certain characteristics about the way it uh, the way it looks. Um, yeah, an attacker will just say, "Okay, you've blocked that. I'll find another way around it." And there's always, you know, there's always an edge case that that, that attackers will find that can circumvent those kind of uh, those kind of attacks. And, and the last thing here I wanted to talk about was really monitoring projects uh, and monitoring your your environments, uh, because with these kind of things, all the eyes go to these projects and try and understand whether the fix was correct, uh, whether there are other ways which you can actually achieve the remote code execution uh, in those projects. And there were a number of future fixes that had to be rolled out as a result of this uh, log for shell uh, incident. Um, as a result, it was very, very important at, at varying risks at different times, but, but it was very, very important to monitor 
the upgrade so that as new vulnerabilities and CVEs were released, you you were getting notified. Um, of course, there's a number, there's an amount of tooling here. I'm not going to go into the tooling per se too much. There's an there's an amount of tooling which Sneak and others can provide uh, to, to 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 do this. But this was typically the remediation uh, that uh, that that was available. Of course, if you're looking to still do these remediations, be sure to check online for the latest and greatest uh, to make sure that the version. Uh, changes, etc., uh, are including the latest uh, the latest uh, uh, movements from these libraries. So, looking at the timeline, what can we learn from this? Well, obviously, we know there was a it was a zero day, right? So, if you look at if if, if you look at the 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 timeline of when the code that introduced the vulnerability first came in, like, as I mentioned, twenty thirteen, almost nine years uh, before, um, and, and it wasn't till 2021, late November, uh, an Alibaba security researcher um, approached Apache with this with this disclosure, and it was being it was being done with Apache. But the problem is, when you actually roll out a fix, when you actually put a fix into an open source project, people can look at that and say, "Why are you Why are you making these code changes?" And they can see what you're essentially defending against. And and, and what this can do then is actually almost partly disclose this type of vulnerability to, to the ecosystem because all of a sudden you're, you're before others can actually start adopting that latest fix you're essentially showing where the where the the uh the attack vector can be can be uh can be can be can be um it, it breached through or exploited so this happened on december 9th um, and of straight away, a POC was published on GitHub, and you know it was leaked on Twitter as well. And we know how we know how this goes, and it tum it, uh, it it kind of snowballs. December tenth was the officially disclosed CVE. So although this was leaked on Twitter and GitHub the day before, the CVE hadn't even been published. And at this stage, you know, you look here day by day, and the poor Log4j uh, maintainers, etc., were working day and night to to uh, on, on you know understanding where future uh, issues and things like that could be uh, could be found and fixed. That's you know an interesting an interesting timeline there, but the. You know, December 10th on the Friday afternoon, I'm sure everyone in this audience was probably, you know, in the incident room, uh, getting a team together. And the first question, which was very often the hardest question is, are we using Log4j? Where are we using it? How close are they to my critical systems? Um, are we exploitable? Right. The, the most common questions. Can can you answer that? W were you able to answer that straight away? Those people who could were very often in ownership of their SBOM or an SBOM, a software bill of materials. Now, a software bill of materials is essentially this inventory. It's like a it's like a library essentially that 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 uh, that itemizes all the uh, components, all the ingredients, as it were, that you are using to construct your applications and put them into your into your production environments. So this this will list. All the third-party libraries, uh, all the third-party components that you're that you're building in, and what this will allow you to do is identify. In this case, are we using the Log4j uh, core, for example, at a particular version? Are we using a vulnerable version of Log4j? Um, are we using Log4j at, at all anywhere? What projects are we using it in? Where in the dependency graph are we using it? Is it a direct dependency? Is it somewhere down the line? Are they fixable? These were the questions that if we had this software bill of materials, uh, we can answer extremely quickly. Now, a software, an SBOM, software bill of materials, um, there are actually standards for this. There's two competing standards right now, which we're likely to keep both in our industry. Um, one is Cyclone DX, one is SPDX. And, and essentially, they're just different formats. Um, one is under OWASP, the other, the Linux Foundation. Uh, Cyclone DX is, is one which is kind of a little bit more, I would say, developer focused in the sense of what you'll see is tooling and, and, and uh, 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 you know, Things that are being created uh, more for the open source world, where they can actually start testing uh, and um, um, you know really kind of 
getting hands on quicker. The SPDX projects is more, I would say, um, uh, standards based. And, and so a, a lot of a lot of the folks from standards uh, backgrounds will tend to kind of resonate more uh, along along these uh, th this angle. But, you know, both are, are you know reasonable standards and we're going to likely see various tools uh, that are probably going to uh, support both. Uh, but this is the this is these are the formats that you can expect your S bombs uh, to to exist. How can you create an S bomb? Well, of course, there are many tools uh, out there. You know, Sneak and others. Again, I'm not going to specifically harp on about one, but there are plenty of tools out there whereby you can uh, scan all of your repositories. It'll take a look at your POM XML files, your Gradle build files, create dependency graphs, and and it will effectively give you this software bill of materials where you can uh, identify and list, categorize, you know, ca sorry, um, uh, catalog the, the open source libraries that you're using. So how can we prepare ourselves then better for, for the next log for shell style incident, whether that's uh, spring for shell right now, I don't know, or, or we'll, we'll see in the coming days, but what can we, what can we do ourselves? Now there's three things. And, and if we take DevSecOps as a good, as a good uh, movement here. The three core pieces of DevSecOps are people, process, and tooling. These three are the core things which we need to, to look at in order uh, to improve our, our, uh, our posture uh, around, around security. People here is the most important, so let's start um, with people. Now, within our organizations, uh, the way you know, DevOps has changed the way that we are delivering software. Uh, you know, I remember 20 years ago when I was working with two-year release cycles, um, people weren't pushing to production anywhere near as fast as, as, as they are today, which is, you know, tends to be daily. As a result, the more periodic security traditional audit style was more appropriate back then than it compared to today. When we're delivering and deploying to production multiple times a day in, in more of a you know CI CD DevOps uh, uh, um, way, we need to recognize that every change that goes to production needs to needs to be scanned in the same way as we would for quality, you know, our unit tests and our integration tests and things like that. Now, there's two things that need to happen there. First of all, you know, you tend to see a hundred devs. 10 ops folks uh, or DevOps folks and, and, and one security person. That one security person can't be there to audit every change, to, to provide information about what to fix on every single change. As a result, we need, a, we need an ownership change here. And shift left is good maybe for a waterfall style, but this is very much more an efficiency play. This is doing something earlier. What we need here is an ownership change where we go from away from this kind of dictatorial uh, security providing for the developer and more to empowering developers. So we want to kind of go from top to bottom. So rather than it's you know a, a dictatorial model, you're really empowering everyone who is making those who's making those changes. And there are a number of things that need to need to um, uh, you know alter in not just our outlook here, but our processes, the the tools we choose, etc. But the core thing here is the responsibility that we as developers have uh, in this new type of model. Now, while we go into responsibility, let's take a look at the context difference in terms of how we look at things. Well, a developer cares about the app. That's their context. They want to get the app working. They want to get the app shipped. They care about various aspects of the app, not just security, whereas an auditor purely cares about risk. OK, they care. They care about, you know, what vulnerabilities exist here. What is the risk? What is what is my exposure uh, in my environment? You zoom up, uh, zoom out. And the, and the developer, like I say, they care about availability. They care about resilience, a huge number of things way beyond uh, way beyond security. Um, whereas the auditor, they then care about, you know, OK, where's my data? What other services are we depending on? How are they secure, et cetera? They look at the overall risk uh, that exists beyond the app. So we have very, very different uh, um, uh, perspectives and points of view. As a result, we need to think about things differently. Auditors or security folks audit. What they care about is doing scans, uh, running tests, creating tickets, and, and that's, their, that's their resolution, the, the creating tickets. The developers, um, when we want to provide and enable, empower developers in security, their end goal is to fix 
They need to they need to resolve issues. They need to they need solutions that they can actually push through rather than just creating tickets. So as a result, our mentality and the changes we need to make need to reflect uh, this model. So let's take a look at Log4J now and, and think about where where we where we uh, identified this issue. Well, where could have this exposure been identified? Well, we couldn't really do anything in our pipeline here because we're not introducing log for shell here. We're, it was, we were already in production. We are, it, this is a zero day. This is something whereby it is affecting us today and we need to react to that. So this is, this is a zero, a zero day where we need to react as fast as we can. Of course, there are other ways uh, which we will cover uh, in a little bit, but this is this is you know at its core we needed to be on this right hand side. Other things that we can kind of like do in order to address other issues. So, for example, what if we were on the left hand side and there is a we're introducing a library which potentially has a known vulnerability, or we just want to assess the risk. How or, you know how much can we trust that library? So there are things that we can do uh, when we're introducing libraries to avoid that potential log for j style um, uh, you know zero day going forward. This is a guide. There are obviously certain anomalies that that can exist. For example, Spring being one of them, which which here today potentially has this Spring for shell issue. Um, but we'll we'll cover that in just a second. So when you're using a library it's important for your developers to ask these questions as they introduce them. Assess these libraries when, you, when you're using them. Don't just pull them in because they have the functionality because they're allowing you to, to, to do uh, what you need to do in order to push this use case through. Check maintenance. How, how active is the maintenance here? Uh, and, and look at the commits over the last year. Is it an abandoned project? Is it something whereby if an issue was found, uh, it, would, it would be resolved pretty quickly? How many issues are there? How many pull requests are, are currently open? What is, the, you know, what is the speed at which they're being, uh, being resolved? And how long ago uh, was the last release? Potentially, if there's something that it uh, depends on and there is a re new release of a version of a transitive dependency, how long will this library take in order to perform a release consuming that latest version? So the maintenance is very, very important to consider. And then of course, next, the popularity. Um, and there's a number of reasons why this is very, very useful, but um, popularity is, is a very, very important trend to make sure you're not using, you know, you're not the only person using this library, but this is in fact a well-trusted uh, by the ecosystem. It's something which lots of people rely on and you're not by yourself in a, in a, in a space uh, whereby no one else is using these kind of libraries. Um, this reliance on a, uh, on a library will very often push things like the demand for maintenance and so forth. Um, thirdly, security. Um, in terms of you know, looking at the most popular version that, uh, that, this, that this library is, 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 has released that people are using and across the version ranges, where are security issues being added? How fast are they being resolved, both in your direct dependency for, for that, um, for that uh, library and the transitives as well? So if a, a transitive has a vulnerability, how soon is that being removed? And then finally, the community. Um, how active is the community? How many contributors are there in the community? And, and how, uh, how likely is it that if there's, you know, obviously just one or two uh, contributors, is that, does that give a, a, an amount of risk for, for this being uh, a, a library that could potentially be abandoned and so forth? So with all of these metrics, what we want to pull together is essentially a health score. Um, and in this case, this what this this is a, an NPM package, for example, called Passport, uh, and, and this is a, a free advisor uh, um, uh, service that that's on the Sneak website. But we provide a score out of a hundred to give you uh, a tr almost like a trust metric or at least a health metric in terms of how reliable this library might be in your environment. And you know you can run this kind of thing across your uh, across your uh, um, dependency graph almost and identify uh, where the weak points are for for your uh, for your dependency graph. Um, 
When we think about other uh, places, so for example, the log for J thing happened, or the log for shelving happened when we were in production already. We, you know, could we have taken steps to identify potential uh, libraries that that you know um, are more prone to these kind of things? Well, we could have done that while we were coding before we kind of add these in. But of course, as I mentioned, anomalies are going to happen. Log4j is one of those very very popular libraries that if you go through those kind of processes, sometimes that kind of thing is just going to happen. It's less likely. Well, maybe. It, <laughs> Sometimes you might think it's less likely potentially for there to maybe be a malicious attack on Log4j, but potentially more likely uh, for for uh, for some uh, some a, a risk to actually be uh, a greater magnitude on the impact it can have on the ecosystem. Now, of course, the other area where we can look at is known vulnerabilities, and and, and known vulnerabilities are essentially a you know a vulnerability which has a, a potentially a CV or other. Uh, um, uh, vulnerability databases. They have an entry there which basically says, this is the vulnerability, this is how uh, severe it is, this is the library it, it's in with this uh, version range between, you know, ultimately where it was introduced and just before it was fixed. Um, and, and this is where it exists in your environment. It's very, very important to be able to automate that, those kind of checks to see when you create your dependency graph, if the libraries that have vulnerabilities in uh, are being introduced into your into your into your application through your builds, now this can be done at various stages. You can automate this into your Git repositories so that as you create pull requests, you can automatically test whether the delta change is introducing new issues, and that might be license issues or security vulnerabilities. This is a great way of being able to. Rather than look at you know potentially a big backlog, make sure you improve your secure development just by looking at your future development first. You can of course test in your CI/CD as well, uh, and and yeah, run tests in your as you know in your Jenkins builds. Uh, there's the opportunity here to block um, and and make sure that you know hey if we get a very critical high severity vulnerability we just don't want to push this through but very often that can that can cause issues with the with you know a, a nicely very slick fast moving uh um build process so you want to judge where you want to be more aggressive where you want to be less aggressive uh and 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 more be there for visibility and and, and be there to raise tickets potentially with an sla to fix within a certain number of days but the core thing is run automation at these various points and have that awareness and that feedback uh, to your developers as early as their IDE uh, with integrations and things like that. Now, one of the core things that we mentioned previously was about developer tooling and create and giving your development teams tools that will address what their needs uh, for security are. And that is to fix, not just to be an auditor and to, and to find. So here are some of the things that you need to think about when trying to work out what tooling your development teams uh, should have. Uh, make sure there's you know, a self-service model to, to, to use those tools. Make sure there's plenty of documentation that your teams as well as the vendor is, is creating for that. The rich API, the command line interface, and the number of integrations is, is core as well, as well as having you know, a big open source uh, community behind it. From a platform scope, which we'll talk about in a little bit, there are many security uh, acronyms, DAST, SAST, IAST, which tend to look more to your code. But think about the wider, more broader application that you're delivering as a cloud native application security uh, concern. And finally, the one piece that I want to I want to stress here is this governance approach. When you're looking at a tool, ask the question, is this tool empowering me as a developer or my developers, or is it dictating to my developers? And that will help you determine whether this is a tool that should fit in your DevOps process or, or whether it doesn't kind of you know, fit the process or the model that you're striving for. Now, finally, we're going to talk about what's beyond the log4j uh, or log4shell risk in our applications. And this is beyond open source libraries. Now, when we think about how we as developers used to write code many, many years ago, certainly when I started 20 years ago, pre-cloud, we thought about the open source libraries that we used to develop. We thought about the application code. 
uh, that we used to develop and we used to consume uh, open source libraries as, as well as developing them ourselves. This constituted the application, which we then threw over the wall to an operations team that looked after the platform, looked after uh, the operations piece, the production environment. Whereas today in a cloud environment, so much of that is now um, more under the control, more under the the, the the governance, the you know the development of a regular application, the Docker files, the infrastructure as code, whether it's Terraform scripts, Kubernetes config, these are the more typical things that we as developers are touching on a day to day basis. And as a result, we need more of an app sec solution to make sure that things that we change, things that we touch, are being done in a secure manner. And you know. A lot of the time, all of these things are existing in our Git repositories. As a result, they're going through the, the development workflows. So what we need to be able to do is make sure we have solutions in place which test these in that development workflow, in our IDEs, in our GitHub repositories, and so forth. When we think about, you know, traditionally, as developers potentially looking at what we are securing, we absolutely go straight to our own code. And while this is an important thing to, you know, statically test as well as dynamically test, it's important to look at what's beneath the water almost as that as that iceberg. And open source code, your containers, your infrastructure as code, your misconfigurations there. Think about where you are most likely uh, to be breached. Is it an open source library? Is it your own code? Or is it an S3 bucket where there's a misconfiguration? Is there a container uh, that contains you know, vulnerabilities in the open source packages? Look at this as one and trying to identify where your most critical issues are based on the stack that you are, you are using. And one of the last things here I wanna, I wanna cover really is something called the supply chain. Um, and and we've, you know maybe you've heard a lot about supply chain security, supply chain risk uh, more recently. The problem is essentially, you know, when I when I started my development days, we had very much internal build systems, internal build. Uh, we had build engineers that were you know running builds literally on our on our own uh, data centers. Um, much much more of that is now you know uh, done by third party software done by SaaS software potentially as well. It's a much more complex pipeline that we've built up over, over the last couple of decades. And it, you know, there's a lot of trust that we need to put on many of these different uh, components in this pipeline. Uh, additionally, we need to understand what's in that pipeline, but also where the weak links are in our, in our chain, uh, where the weak links are in our, um, in our supply chain, as well as that pipeline to identify where uh, we are most vulnerable. So let's take a look at where the security risks are potentially uh, as, as part of our pipeline. Well, first of all, we have the pipeline that we deliver. So we as developers checking code into Git, pushing to a build pipeline, storing perhaps in an artifact repository before pushing to a consumer, maybe uh, um, you know, into our production environment or to another supply chain potentially as well. Now, the first thing, the thing that we've mentioned mostly here is these third party libraries. Um, one of the big questions here, there's two pieces here. One is the supply chain risk that we, or, or yeah, the risk that we add into our application from our supply chain. And the second one is a potential supply chain attack. And the two are quite different. The second one there is about the compromise of our, of our dependencies. So let me ask you a question here. Do you think log4j, log4shell, do you think that was a supply chain attack? Interesting, interesting to kind of know your responses there. Is it a supply chain attack? Well, think about who the attacker is, okay? So who is the attacker uh, that is potentially trying to, uh, trying to break, uh, uh, you know, perform the attack? Second question, what are they trying to attack? What is it that they are trying to break, trying to attack, trying to compromise? Okay, uh, you'll have likely said the attacker is going to be, a, you know, some external, you know, you can imagine them in the in the in the in the basement hoodie. OK, it's a bit stereotypical, but, you know, they're, they're typically some attacker out there who is trying to break your application that contains Log4j. They're attacking your application. They're not attacking your supply chain. So Log4j is providing you with supply chain risk 
but it's not a supply chain attack. An attack on your supply chain is where the attacker is trying to intentionally break maybe a library, maybe trying to compromise your library, your container, for example, and other things that we'll talk about. But the attacker is breaking your supply chain. They're not trying to attack your, your application. You're not trying to attack your endpoints. They're trying to break your supply chain. The malicious code will typically get introduced. You know, the actual attack vector will get introduced in your supply chain. They're not trying to attack you know, an endpoint or attack something that you've put into production. Now, um, the second uh, piece, obviously, containers very, very similar there with kind of, you know, vulnerabilities or, or compromises, such should I say, that can come in uh, through your through your container images as well, public container images. Now, the second one is the compromise of the pipeline, compromise of developer code, uh, someone trying to attack your Git repository, someone trying to, you know, break into to your build through misconfigurations in your build environments, potentially unauthorized. Uh, attacks into your into your pipeline and then the third piece of a supply chain uh, attack is this compromise of a pipeline dependency so uh, for example codecov uh, was one solar winds uh, was another one here with the build tools and the and the, and the codecov uh, um, plugin that was added here the, you know they were compromised and they were they were added uh, uh, you know as a ci plugin codecov as a ci plugin the compromised malicious version of that plugin was added into other people's pipelines, attacking their pipelines, taking credentials, taking environment variables, and sending it off to evil servers. This is where a, a supply. This is what a supply chain attack really looks like. Um, these are potentially very lucrative to exploit because if you look at CodeCov, that was a cascading supply chain attack. So the actual attack happened on the CodeCov. Um, uh, supply chain that was then used in other supply chains. So it cascades to huge numbers of pipelines, uh, giving out huge numbers of credentials. So this is where we're thinking, um, you know, beyond the, 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 the open source uh, libraries. And as I mentioned, cascading effects are some of the most, uh, some of the, some of the biggest ones that, um, that can, that can be attacked. Okay. Hopefully that gives you some, you know, a good insight here into some of the things that you can, actionable tips that you can actually take away and also areas of risk that you can look at because, you know, while today it's log for shell or, or spring for shell, tomorrow, you know, there could be another attack vector and we need to think very holistically about the overall application uh, that we're deploying and where the greatest risk in our processes, our teams uh, uh, and, and where our tooling can really help us out there. So uh, happy to take questions uh, that that, uh, that you have.